A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu newspaper analysis brought to you by Shankara AS Academy. Today's date is 28th July 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the first news article discussion. Take a look at this text and context article. It focuses on the recent flooding that occurred along the river Yamuna. See the essence of the article is that this gross mismanagement of Yamuna flood plains is the cause of flooding. So in our news article discussion today, we'll discuss about the points mentioned in the article in detail. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. First of all, what is a flood plain? See, a flood plain is a flat area of land adjacent to the river. It normally extends from the banks of the river to the outer edge of the valley. You can look at this image for a better understanding. Remember, a flood plain consists of two parts, the flood way and the flood fringe. The main channel of the river is called flood way. Beyond the flood way is the flood fringe. The flood fringe extends from the outer banks of the flood way to the edge of the river valley. For perennial rivers, the flood way or stream channel has water for almost all year round. The flood fringe receives water mainly during the rainy season and during floods. So having this basic understanding, now let us see about the Yamuna flood plain. See the river Yamuna enters New Delhi from Palla village and exits at the Okla barrage. The Yamuna flood plains are 2 km wide on each side. Along Delhi, the river flows for about 22 km. This 22 km along with the 2 km wide flood plains is designated as the O zone by the Delhi Development Authority and this area is approximately 6700 hectares. So what are the importance of Yamuna flood plains? See the flood plains act as natural flood control. Yamuna flood plains act as a natural sponges that can absorb excess water during heavy rainfall or when river overflow. This helps mitigate the impact of floods thereby protecting adjacent areas from severe flooding. Secondly, they play an important role in groundwater recharge. See, during periods of flooding, water from river water infiltrates into the ground and recharges the underlying aquifers. This process helps maintain groundwater levels and provides a reliable water source for human use. Thirdly, the Yamuna flood plains also play an important role in flood water storage and slow release. See, Indian monsoon is known for its uncertainty, right? There are years when we receive excess rainfall and there are years when we receive deficit rainfall. With climate, the Indian monsoon has become more and more unpredictable. To address this issue, we need a flood plain. The flood plains help in ensuring stability in water availability and help balance between years of excessive rainfall and years of low rainfall. Since the flood plains can hold large volumes of water during floods, they also act as natural reservoirs. During the years of lean monsoon, the water stored in the flood plains is slowly released over time. This slow release of water over time helps regulate river flow, preventing sudden surges and maintaining more consistent water levels downstream. Lastly, the Yamuna flood plain also provides livelihood opportunities. See, of the 9,700 hectares of Yamuna flood plains in Delhi, 3,330 hectares are farmlands as of 2020. Farming is mainly practiced along the Palla and Hiranki villages. Farmers use the rich silt deposited by the river to grow crops like rice, wheat and flowers. On one hand, farming has low ecological footprint and on the other hand, it provides livelihood opportunities to farmers and in turn curbing distress migration. So these are all some of the important roles played by the Yamuna flood plains. Now the problem in Delhi is that due to heavy in-migration and lax government 
regulations many human settlements emerged along the flood plains mainly along the flood fringes and this year due to unpredictable rains in july river yamuna started swelling this resulted in the river spilling over into its flood fringe and in turn flooding the human settlements located there this is what happens when us humans fail to recognize the river's right to expand see i mentioned that flooding happens due to increasing human settlement in the yamuna flood plains right but when did the problem start when did human settlements start emerging along the flood plains of the river see the first phase of settlement happened post independence from the refugees from western punjab started settling along the flood plain then during the first and second five year plan period the government promoted rapid urbanization during this period rajgarh the ring road and the thermal power plant were constructed in the yamuna flood plains then during the 1982 asian games more than 1 million migrant laborers came to delhi from the neighboring states they were tasked with building flyovers sports facilities and luxury apartments but they were not provided any formal housing so once the asian games got over these laborers settled along the yamuna flood plains like this slowly wave after wave illegal settlements increased along the flood plains the judiciary took some steps to address the issue for example in 2004 delhi high court ordered eviction of unauthorized settlement on the flood plains due to this order around 2 lakh people were evicted then in 2016 the national green tribunal imposed a blanket ban on agriculture related activities till the yamuna is restored and made pollution free but both these backfired although the judiciary acted with right intentions the clearing of unauthorized settlements and farming areas along the yamuna flood plains resulted in the increase in capital incentive projects along the flood plains which are more dangerous to yamuna flood plains bus depots akshardham temple complex commonwealth games village metro depots luxury apartments and highways were constructed along the yamuna flood plains this is how human settlement emerged along the flood plains it is not like the government did not know about the ill effects of allowing human settlements along the flood plains there are many government regulations that have provisions regarding conservation of flood plains but it is in the implementation where the government has failed for example the emuna flood plain was designated as a protected area free from construction in the delhi master plan of 1962 then in the year 2000 the central ground water authority notified the flood plains as protected for ground water management Finally in the draft master plan for Delhi 2041 the Yamuna flood plains were designated as zone O it was subdivided into two parts river zone that is active flood plains and river front along the river zone that is active flood plain construction is prohibited so the rules and regulations are in place but the implementation is not happening this has led to more encroachment and risk of flooding Now finally let us see what can be done to avoid flood encroachment which is the main root cause of all the misery that Delhi is facing right now see the solution is proper flood plain zoning flood plain zoning is a way of managing the use of land in areas that are prone to flooding the main purpose of flood plain zoning is to reduce the risk of damage and protect people and property from the dangers of flooding flat plain zoning basically involves dividing the flat plain into different zones each zone will have specific rules and restrictions on what can be built or done there for example in areas close to the river or stream where flooding is most likely to occur they will have stricter rules in these areas construction of homes or buildings is restricted or even prohibited this helps in minimizing the potential for loss and damage during floods on the other hand areas further away from the river or stream may have fewer restrictions and certain activities like parks or agriculture might be allowed 
This is because the risk of flooding is lower in those areas. So in essence, floodplain zoning helps in ensuring that development is balanced with the natural processes of the floodplains. In addition to floodplain zoning, steps like creating climate resilient infrastructures, desilting drains, creating green areas and improving drainage systems can also help reduce the risk of flooding. So in conclusion, we can say that although natural hazards like flooding will continue to happen in the future, but by taking proper steps, we can prevent these hazards from turning into a disaster. That's all regarding this news article. We saw in detail about what led to flooding in the Yamuna floodplains, what are the reasons for the human settlement in the floodplains, and how the issue can be sorted out. So these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. This business page article says that our government is open to introducing a production linked incentive that is PLI scheme for investments in the chemicals and pharmaceuticals sectors. The government is of the opinion that the PLI scheme will help in reducing import of chemicals which can be produced in India. This is the crux of the article given here. In this context, let us quickly revise about what is this PLI scheme. See, the Protection Linked Incentive or PLA scheme was introduced by the Government of India. The scheme aims at promoting domestic production and reducing imports. It provides performance linked incentives to businesses. The scheme aligns with the Make in India initiative and it encourages both foreign and domestic companies to expand their production and exports. For example, let's consider the automobile industry. Under the PLA scheme, automobile manufacturers are offered incentives based on incremental sales of cars manufactured in India. This means that if a company increases its sales of domestically produced cars compared to the previous year, it becomes eligible for incentives. This encourages companies to produce more vehicles domestically. So this will not only boost employment opportunities but also reduce the country's reliance on imported automobiles. The eligibility criteria for availing the PLA scheme differ across sectors. To be eligible, companies must have a registered manufacturing unit in India. The minimum investment requirements also vary depending on the sector like rupees 10 crore for micro small and medium enterprises rupees 100 crore for others and approximately 1000 crores for investment oriented companies so far the government has announced pli schemes for 14 sectors the 14 sectors are mobile manufacturing manufacturing of medical devices automobiles and auto components pharmaceuticals bulk drugs specialty steel telecom and networking products electronic products, white goods like ACs and LEDs, then renewable energy products, textile products, solar PV modules, advanced chemistry cell, ACC battery, and finally drone and drone components. See the scheme will provide an incentive of 4% to 6% on incremental sales of goods manufactured in India to eligible companies for a period of 5 years. Let me explain the working of the scheme with an example. Imagine there is a company called XY that manufactures electronic devices like smartphones in India. Under the PLA scheme, XY would be eligible for incentives based on their incremental sales of domestically manufactured phones, which means the increase in sales compared to a base year. Let's say in the base year, XY sold 1 lakh smartphones. Now in the following year, XY manages to sell 1,20,000 smartphones, then they would be eligible for incentives on the 20,000 incremental units sold. The incentives provided would be in the range of 4% to 6% of the value of those 20,000 additional smartphones. This is how the PLA scheme actually works. Now let us see why this scheme is significant. See firstly it boosts domestic manufacturing as I already said. The PLI scheme encourages companies to increase their production capacity. This contributes to reducing the country's reliance on imports and strengthens the Make in India initiative. Second significance is the creation of employment opportunities. 
The PLI scheme incentivizes companies to expand their manufacturing facilities in India. This results in generation of employment opportunities in India. Then it will help in reducing import dependency. The scheme encourages domestic companies to increase their production and compete globally. Therefore, it helps to decrease the need for importing goods from other countries. Then it will also encourage technological advancements. To quantify for incentives, companies need to enhance their production capabilities, right? This will encourage companies to adopt advanced technologies and practices. Finally, it will also help in attracting foreign investment. So these are all some of the important points that you have to remember about PLI scheme. A very important and an innovative scheme. So make note of it and use it in your main answer writing. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. Recently, the Union Health Ministry announced that it is going to relax the norms for biosimilars. In response to the Health Ministry's announcement, a section of scientists and doctors has urged the Health Ministry and Department of Biotechnology to not to ease the norms for biosimilars. They pointed out that relaxing the norms would affect the safety of the patients and it would create other hazardous effects. Some health experts say that about 3% of biosimilar drugs are found to be of non-standard quality even when regulations are in place. Then imagine what will happen if the norms are relaxed. So they urged the health ministry not to relax the norms for biosimilars. This is about the news article given here. So in this news article discussion, let us understand what is this biosimilars. But to understand biosimilars, you should first learn about biologics. Biologics refers to the biological medicines that have been developed from living organisms like human, animal, microorganism and etc. Basically, the biologics consist of sugar, protein, nucleic acid or living entities like cells and tissues. Biologics are mostly developed using biotechnology methods like recombinant DNA technology or using other cutting edge technologies. Some of the examples of biologics include vaccines, gene and some blood products like plasma and serum. Now here you might have a doubt how biologics are different from conventional drugs. See most of the conventional drugs are developed using chemical synthesis methods. Here chemical synthesis methods refers to the process by which one or more chemical reactions are performed to convert a raw material into a final product. Since conventional drugs are produced using chemical synthesis methods, the structure of the drug is always identifiable. This means that a finished conventional drug can be analyzed to determine all the various components of the drugs. This factor helps the researchers to develop conventional drugs with similar composition. But if we take biologics, most of the biologics are developed using biotechnology methods and they contain complex mixtures of biological components from living organisms. Here the issue is some of the components of a finished biologic may be unknown. Therefore, the biologics are not easily identified or characterized. This is the main difference between biologics and conventional drugs. Having this understanding, now let us see what is biosimilars. See, biosimilars refers to the biological medicine that is highly similar to already approved biological medicine. So we can say that biosimilars are an identical copy of already approved original biologics. Here the biologic which is used to develop biosimilar is called the reference product. Now talking about the problems with the biosimilars, see as we already saw, it is hard to identify the components present in biologics. This is because biologics contain a complex mixture of biological components from living organisms. So, developing biosimilars with the help of biologics may end up in developing low standard drugs. This is the main problem with the biosimilars. And that is why scientists are urging the government not to relax the norms. That's all regarding this news article. In this news article, we learnt about a new term called biosimilars. 
So with these learnt points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this text and context page. See today, that is July 28, is World Hepatitis Day. So five quiz questions related to hepatitis appeared in the news today. We'll try to answer the quiz questions. But before that, we shall learn few facts about hepatitis and its types. What is hepatitis? See, in general, hepatitis refers to the inflammation of the liver. The liver inflammation occurs when there is a damage to the liver cells. Look at the image here. This is how an inflammated liver looks like. Here the liver has become enlarged beyond its normal size. This inflammation of the liver is only termed as hepatitis. Now what causes this liver inflammation? See mostly liver inflammation can be caused by several viruses like hepatitis A virus, hepatitis B virus and so on. Remember, if the inflammation of the liver is caused by the virus, then it is termed as viral hepatitis. Apart from viruses, several other factors like drugs and alcohol consumption, then certain genetic disorders can also cause liver inflammation. Moving on to the types of hepatitis, see there are five types of hepatitis like hepatitis A, B, C, D and E. Each type of hepatitis is caused by a different hepatitis virus. Now let us learn about them one by one. First let us take Hepatitis A. See Hepatitis A is caused by Hepatitis A virus HAV. Hepatitis A is mostly a food borne illness. It can be spread through contaminated water and unwashed food. Note that Hepatitis A can be easily transmitted especially in children. But the good thing is that Hepatitis A is least likely to damage the river. It is usually mild and completely resolved within 6 months. Now coming to Hepatitis B. See Hepatitis B is caused by the Hepatitis B virus HBV. It is transmitted through exposure to contaminated blood, needles, syringes or bodily fluids. It can even transmit from mother to baby. In some cases Hepatitis B may lead to long term liver damages and liver cancer. Now coming to Hepatitis C. See, Hepatitis C is caused by the Hepatitis C virus, HCV. Like Hepatitis B, it is also transmitted through infected blood or from mother to newborn during childbirth. In the long term, Hepatitis C can also lead to liver cancer. Now, talking about Hepatitis D. See, Hepatitis D is also called Delta Hepatitis. It is a serious liver disease caused by the Hepatitis D virus, HDV. It is transmitted through direct contact with infected blood. Hepatitis D is a rare form of hepatitis that only occur in conjunction with Hepatitis B infection. Know that Hepatitis D virus cannot multiply without the presence of Hepatitis B. Okay? So we can say that Hepatitis D occur in the person when such person is affected with Hepatitis B. Now talking about Hepatitis E. See, Hepatitis E is a waterborne disease caused by the Hepatitis E virus, HEV. Hepatitis E mainly occurs in the area where there is poor sanitation. Hepatitis E is predominantly found in Africa, Asia and South America. So, these are all the facts about the types of Hepatitis. Talking about the symptoms, the symptoms of Hepatitis include fever, loss of appetite, diarrhea, nausea, abdominal discomfort and jaundice. In some cases, hepatitis can also cause liver cancer. Talking about its prevention, see the prevention of hepatitis transmission varies depending upon the type. For example, hepatitis A and E are most commonly spread through food and water. So, some activities like washing the hands carefully after using the bathroom, then avoiding fruits and vegetables that are washed or grown in unsanitized water can prevent the transmission of hepatitis A and E. Now coming to hepatitis B, C, D. As I said earlier, these types of vaccines commonly spread through infected blood or bodily fluids. So activities like using unused and clean needles, then avoiding the sharing of toothbrushes and razors may help to prevent the spread of hepatitis B, C and D. Talking about the vaccination, except hepatitis C, all other types of hepatitis can be prevented by administering vaccine. So remember, currently there is no vaccine for Hepatitis C. Now with these accumulated informations, let us try to answer the quiz questions. Look at this first question. 
the question as to find the segments in the liver see as hepatitis is related to liver inflammation this first question about liver was asked as you all know liver is the largest organ in the human body it is located in upper right part of the abdomen it performs various functions in our body like controlling chemical levels in the blood then breaking down fats and so on remember anatomically liver is divided into eight independent segments each segment of the liver has its own inflow and outflow of the blood so the correct answer for this question is eight segments moving on to the second question this question asks you to find what was the original name of hbv vaccine see hepatitis b vaccine or hbv is used to prevent hepatitis b infection the original name of this vaccine is recombivax hb or recombivax hepatitis b this vaccine was developed using recombinant dna technique that's why the name recombivax was used okay i'm not really very sure about this answer we'll wait till tomorrow to confirm what is the right answer okay now look at this third question recently paleopathologist cracked a 200 year old puzzle the puzzle is what killed beethoven they figured using dna analysis finally that it was hepatitis b egged on by his love of consuming spirits what recombinant of the genus composer did the experts use to arrive at their conclusion this is the question see the person mentioned here beethoven he was a german composer and pianist who was born in 1770 He was one of the most admired composer in the history of western music. Later he also got many health complications. Subsequently the hearing of Beethoven also deteriorated. So he used some hearing aids. Sadly he died in 1827 but the reason for death was not known for many years. The recent DNA analysis revealed that the cause of Beethoven's death was due to severe liver inflammation associated with alcohol consumption and hepatitis B infection. Here coming to the question what remnants of Beethoven are used to arrive at the cause of the death? The correct answer is the hair of Beethoven. It is used to arrive at the cause of the death. Now coming to the fourth question Vaccines are available for some strains of hepatitis not for others which are they see we saw the answer for this already the correct answer here is hepatitis C now moving on to the final question medication has been proven to cure one particular strain of hepatitis studies show that about 95% of those with the infection are cured with these drugs which strain is it See the correct answer is hepatitis C despite the vaccine not being available for hepatitis C it is curable in more than 95% of cases see people who test positive for hepatitis C should be treated with direct active antiviral drugs that is DAA drugs okay so these are all some of the points that you have to make note of with respect to hepatitis with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion Take a look at this editorial article. It speaks about some serious concerns regarding the Forest Conservation Bill. On July 26, the Lok Sabha passed the Forest Conservation Amendment Bill with no significant alteration from the initial version presented in March. It ignored strong public objections that highlight a number of concerns. The preamble of the bill promises to achieve net zero emissions by 2070, creating a carbon sink increasing forest cover and improving the livelihoods of forest dependent communities however the operative part of the bill shows little assurance to the preamble so this is the crux of the editorial article given here so in this news article discussion we shall see some of the important points mentioned in the editorial article before that the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference you can pass the video and go through it now talking about the bill See this amendment bill acknowledges the need to address current development requirements but it significantly deviates from the original forest conservation act of 1980 regarding the newly proposed amendments the environmental experts are concerned about three key aspects of the bill they are narrow definition of forest 
exclusion of significant tract of forest area and granting of sanction to additional activities now let us discuss these three aspects in detail firstly the narrow definition of forest see the bill will significantly restrict the application of the landmark goda verman judgment of 1996 This judgment actually extended the scope of the original 1980 act. According to the judgment, even the areas with trees can be considered as forest rather than just areas legally notified as forest. But the current amendment narrows the scope of the Forest Conservation Act because it includes only legally notified forest and forest notified in government records. This change in definition could potentially impact around 28 percentage of India's forest cover, while these forests may include just fruit orchards and plantations. They are also needed for conservation of India's rich biodiversity. If you don't understand, let me explain it with an example. For example, imagine there is a forest land in Naha land. which is not recorded as forest by the government but this forest has been protected by indigenous tribes for centuries let's assume the state government didn't identify this forest despite the goda verman judgment since this forest is not identified by the state government according to the new amendment the government is free to allow the destruction of these forests for construction and development Now this narrow definition of forest in the bill might ultimately lead to exploitation of more forest areas this is the first concern now coming to the second concern that is the exclusion of significant tracts of forest areas see the bill excludes certain fragile ecosystems from requiring forest clearances also the security related infrastructure development within 100 km of international borders is exempted from getting clearance this exemption endangers the ecologically crucial areas like the forest in the north eastern india and the high altitude himalayan forest which are globally recognized as biodiversity hotspots now this is the second concern Thirdly the bill introduces exemptions for construction projects like zoos safari parks and eco tourism facilities see artificially created green areas and animal enclosures are very different from natural ecosystems which provide a bouquet of ecosystem services that contribute significantly to human well-being another important concern in the bill is that it also grants unrestricted powers to the union government to specify any desired use beyond those specified in the amendment these provisions raise legitimate concerns about the potential exploitation of forest resources without adequate environmental scrutiny because of these concerns the bill has been met with widespread criticism from environmental groups forest right activists and opposition parties also note that the bill does not mention the forest rights act 2006 which gives forest people certain rights over forest land this means that forest people may not be consulted before their land is diverted for non forest purposes this could lead to the disempowerment of forest people and the violation of their rights take for example in nepal involving forest people in the management of forest has helped to increase forest cover from 26 percentage to 45 percentage in just 3 decades if india is to meet its climate goals it should involve forest people in the management of forest apart from this the forest conservation act of 1980 took a protective approach to forest clearances making the process time consuming and expensive but the proposed amendment does not address these flaws instead it simply exempts certain sectors from the fca's requirements according to the author this is not a good solution because it removes an important check on the environmental impact of development projects currently the bill is being debated in the rajya sabha and it is not yet clear whether it will be passed or not However the concern raised about the bill are serious and they should be carefully considered before the bill is finalized that's all regarding this news article in this news article we saw some of the objectionable provisions in the forest conservation amendment bill 
So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Take a look at this news article. It says that Pradhan Mantri Gramin Sadak Yojana PMGSY has not been able to complete the construction of all the roads that were planned under the first and second phases. This has caused a lot of inconvenience to people living in rural areas who are still waiting for road connectivity. So the parliamentary panel has asked the government to take steps to complete the construction of the remaining roads and to ensure that the targets under the scheme are met. So in this context, let us learn about Pradhan Mantri Gramin Sadak Yojana. See, the Pradhan Mantri Gramin Sadak Yojana PMGSY was launched in 2000 to provide all-weather road connectivity to unconnected villages in India. This scheme is funded jointly by the central government and the state governments. Under this scheme, roads are constructed to a minimum standard of 7.5 meters width and 100 mm thickness. The roads are also designed to be all-weather, meaning they can be used throughout the year regardless of the weather conditions. Rural roads constructed under the scheme will be in accordance with the standards set by the Indian Roads Congress IRC, which was set up in 1934. Now, coming to the important objective of the scheme. See, firstly, it aims to provide road connectivity to all villages with a population of 500 or more in the plains and 250 or more in the hills. Secondly, the scheme aims to improve the quality of existing rural roads. Also, it targets on promoting the economic development and social inclusion in rural areas. Now, what is the funding pattern? As I already said, the union government bears 90% of the project cost in respect of projects sanctioned in Northeast and Himalayan states, whereas for other states, the union government bears 60% of the cost. Remaining will be funded by the state governments. So it is a centrally sponsored scheme. Now moving on to the achievements of the scheme. See, as of March 2023, PMGSY has connected over 1,78,000 villages in India. The scheme has helped to improve the connectivity of rural areas to markets, schools and hospitals. This in turn has led to increased economic opportunities and improved access to essential services for rural communities. Despite these achievements, there are some drawbacks in implementing the scheme. The government has not able to provide the necessary funds to complete all the projects under PMGSY. This has led to delays in road construction and some villages have had to wait years for their road to be built. The Panchayati Raj institutions are responsible for implementing PMGSY projects in rural areas. However, these PRIs have not been involved in the planning and execution of these projects. This has again led to delay of projects. In some areas, like the hilly states, the working season for road construction is limited due to the weather. This can lead to delays in project completion. Additionally, the difficult terrain in these areas can make road construction more challenging and expensive. In some areas, like those affected by left-wing extremism, there are security concerns that can hinder road construction. So these are all some of the challenges in implementing the scheme which is delaying its completion. Overall, the scheme is a major initiative to improve rural connectivity in India. It has helped to promote economic development, social inclusion in rural areas. So these are all some of the important facts that you have to remember about Pradhan Mantri Gramin Sadak Yojana. That's all regarding the Hindu newspaper analysis for the day. Now let's move on to the next part of the newspaper analysis which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Look at this first question. Which of the four options given best defines the term biosimilar? See the correct answer here is option C. Biosimilars refers to a biological medicine that is highly similar to already approved original biological medicine. Okay. So the correct answer is option C. Now moving on, look at this question about production linked incentive scheme. Three statements are given and you have to find how many statements are correct here. First statement, incentive is provided for incremental sale of domestically manufactured goods. Second statement, both foreign and domestic companies are covered under this scheme. Now the third statement says recently the chemical and petrochemicals sector is included under PLI scheme. 
So here this third statement is alone incorrect. As we saw in the discussion, the government is open to inclusion of chemicals and petrochemical sectors under the PLA scheme, but it is still not included under the scheme. Okay. So here the correct answer is option B only two. Now look at this question about Pradhan Mantri Gram in Sadak Yojana. Three statements are given, and you have to find how many statements given here are correct. See here the correct answer for the question is. Option A, one only. First statement is actually correct. The scheme is partially funded by central and state governments. So it is a centrally sponsored scheme. Now the second statement is actually not correct. Scheme aims to provide road connectivity to all unconnected villages in the country, not just Himalayan and northeastern states. Now the third statement is also incorrect. The scheme is being implemented by Ministry of Rural Development. So here the correct answer for the question is option A only one. Now moving on, displayed here are the mains practice questions for you today. Just go through the question, try to write an answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, hit like, do comment, and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Now thank you for listening.